like to introduce our uh, first speaker. So Evan Fields Black is uh, uh, a uh, works in pre-colonial West African history at Carnegie mm Mellon, -hmm. and she is the author of Deep Roots: Rice Farmers in West Africa and the African Diaspora. And uh, she's been studying rice and rice farmers in West Africa and in South Carolina and Georgia. So that yeah, you you have a wonderful. I think a, a, a internationalizing U.S. history moment, which is always so valuable. And mm -hmm. Let me just invite you up and have. Okay. You. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? In the far corners of the room, I hope. Okay, great. I'm really excited to be here with you today um, and want to thank Michelle for inviting me to talk with you about one of my favorite topics, a topic that I don't get to talk about quite as much these days. I'm working on a new book which has a lot of rice in it, but it has a lot of other things in it like indigo and sea island cotton about which I know very little about at this moment, but I'm learning. Um, so one of my favorite topics being rice and rice farmers, primarily in West Africa, but also in coastal South Carolina and Georgia. What I'm going to do today is to show you some pictures that I took during my field work uh, back in the late 90s in what is today the Republic of Guinea Conakry. Um, and I'm also I'm going to use these pictures as a way to elucidate the history of rice farming in Western Africa in a small corner called the Upper Guinea Coast. And I'm going to talk a little bit toward the end of my remarks about what happened to West African rice farmers who were enslaved on rice plantations in coastal South Carolina and Georgia and what happens to their technology. So. Before I get started, okay. these days when I talk about rice, I always show this photograph. It is a picture of me <coughs> a couple years ago <laughs> <laughs> with my great-grandmother, whose name was Anna Richard Frazier. And she was over 100 years old at the time that this photograph was taken. It was taken in Miami, Florida, where I grew up. Um, but my father's family, and this was my father's grandmother, is from coastal South Carolina, from Colleton County, South Carolina, from Green Pond, South Carolina. And in hindsight, my great grandmother has been, when I say in hindsight, we're talking 20, 25 years into studying rice farmers in West Africa, 25 years in, OK, maybe 20 years in rice fields, um, really understanding why I do this and why I'm so passionate and connected, passionate about and connected to this work. So if you know anything about anybody here know South Carolina? OK, I'm in California. I'm really <laughs> in California now. <laughs> Colleton County, Green Pond, South Carolina, even today, if one were to drive down Highway 17, as I do periodically, as far as the eye can see, the only thing that's there are rice fields. The highway today in 2014 goes right over the rice fields. Okay, So again, this is a 20-year journey of figuring out that my dad's family is from this area where there's nothing but rice. All of the plantations in this region grew rice. So here's my great grandmother. At the time, she'd been relocated to Miami, Florida, to her daughter's house, my aunt. And she had dementia, OK? And she sat in her rocking chair, over 100 years old, all day long, performing actions that were familiar <coughs> to her from growing up in Green Pond, South Carolina, where she spent her entire life except maybe the last five years. And when I came back, I was back and forth in Philadelphia and Gainesville and Atlanta and West Africa and France and all these places doing research as a graduate student. When I came back from my field work, everybody was up in arms 
because her de dementia had reached a stage where she could not communicate and she would just pantomime all day long. And a particular set of actions were really concerning to my aunt because my great grandmother, and I'm gonna step away from the mic here, would sit in her chair and lean over, three fingers, and she's pressing them into the earth. To my aunt's eyes, she's gonna tumble out of the chair, right? So she's trying to prevent my great grandmother from doing this. To my eyes, having just returned from West Africa and sowed rice seeds with women, um, to me as the researcher, beginning to understand where rice is located in South Carolina and how it's mapped onto that geography. I knew she was planting rice. I knew she was planting rice and that this was something that she'd grown up doing, that she'd probably watched and learned from her mother uh, and her sisters to do. And I knew at that moment I began to know at that moment, this is a journey. This is why I'm doing this, right? This is why I'm doing this. That rice is, this is why rice is so deep in my bones, if you will, and why I've spent a, over a year in these really difficult conditions planting rice um, under the rains, with the mosquitoes, with the leeches, blah, 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 <laughs> in, in coastal Guinea because I had to know what she did. I had to know how she and the rest of my family lived so that I could really understand this work and understand sort of my family. Okay, so having told you why I do this <laughs> um, and that I take great pride in doing this, I do take great pride in, in being descended from her and being descended from um, rice farmers who were enslaved in South Carolina. Uh, let's go back to West Africa. Okay, so West African rice, Oriza glabarima, um, was domesticated in the inland Niger Delta of Mali. Do I have a pointer? Uh, yes. Okay, good. I just buried. So I don't have to be Vanna there White today. You go. Great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the Niger River sort of curves around right here. And right around here is where West African rice, Oriza glabarima, was domesticated. Archaeologists say about 300 BC to 300 AD. And it spreads from here to what historians call the Upper Guinea Coast. And that is from present day, my Upper Guinea Coast is from present day Senegal River down to Liberia. When you talk about rice, you're really talking about the Gambia River right here in the middle of Senegal down to present day Liberia. And we're not exactly sure when the spread takes place, okay? Um, but it's not only a spread, it's a proliferation to the point where in this region, African farmers learn how to grow rice in about 40 different ways with all 40 or 50 different kinds of irrigation systems in very different kinds of terrain, Judy Carney calls it the landscape gradient, from the low-lying, salty mangroves up into the dry, rocky hillsides and everything in between. They learn how to maximize all of these different microenvironments. Some of them have salt water, some of them have fresh water. They just create all of these really sophisticated ways to maximize it. We know this hundreds of years before the Portuguese arrive, right? So we have a few glimpses from Arabic travelers' accounts, very few. But we know that by the time the Portuguese arrive in the mid-1400s, these things are well-developed. The Portuguese are not bringing it. They're buying rice. They're buying sort of the products of it. Now, 
According to the Transatlantic Slave Trade database, which is a database of about 35,000 slaving voyages, and this is the most that today, 2014, we as historians can document. According to this database, about 40 percent, a little bit more than 40 percent, of the captives who are taken to coastal South Carolina and Georgia um, are coming from this Upper Guinea Coast region. And in fact, they're coming from two places, primarily the Gambia River and then the Sierra Leone estuary. These, this entire region, 40% of the captives are coming from. These two locations, Sierra Leone estuary, Gambia River, um, being the two most important ports. Now, what I'm going to show you today are photographs of mangrove rice cultivation um, that takes place from the Gambia River down to right about here, which is the Rio Pongo region of Guinea and mangroves being just one microenvironment. I mentioned about 40, and 40 different, it's about 37, I'll round it up to 40, different irrigation systems. This is just one in this, in this area that West African rice farmers developed. Why is it important? Because when you look on the South Carolina side, Tidal rice farming is almost an exact replica of mangrove rice farming. Particularly tidal rice farming in the early 1700s. It will evolve, it becomes mechanized. So British planters are going to modernize it and mechanize it. But in its earliest stages, it's almost an exact replica of mangrove rice farming in West Africa. Okay, so let's look at how it is done. This would have been a rice field that was cultivated the previous year, okay? So this is the beginning of field work. And I wanna call your attention to a couple of things. First of all, if you can see this raised mound of earth in the background, this would be the perimeter of the field. So it kind of goes like this, and if the picture extended, it would go around in sort of a rectangle all around the field. This would be the delimitation between, let's say, this elder who happened to be the head of his entire family, but he has brothers. So he's gonna inherit the land from his father and divide the land among himself and his brothers. These embankments would show where his land ends and his brother's land begins. Okay. These embankments also serve the purpose of trapping fresh water in the fields. At one point, this would have been mangroves. It's been cleared. The roots have been pulled up. Okay. Once that's done, you allow it to just lie there for years because there's naturally, these are brackish soils and brackish water. And you've got to wash a certain percentage of that salt out of the soil by just allowing that fresh water to collect for years and shutting it off from the tidal flow that's coming in. When certain weeds begin to appear, you know that the swamp is sweet, so to speak, and that rice can be planted. So after planting that rice, well, I should say that these smaller embankments, these are called the, the buns, okay? Each year, the farmers come in with their shovels, which I'll discuss in a minute, turning the weeds into the soil to create these small embankments within the fields. These are also used, and they go all the way back, 
to trap fresh water into the fields. And it's between them that where the rice will be planted. Okay? So this is the process of using the weeds and the stubble from the previous year as a green kind of, a green fertilizer. Turning the soil, turning the weeds into the soil, allow them to rot for a couple of weeks, and then they will plant in this part of the field, which is a nursery for the rice seedlings. Uh, this is father and son. This is father and son. Okay. Traditionally, all of the men in the village are going to turn the earth. Here we have a couple of younger men, okay? Probably late teens, I would say probably late teens. And they look like, first of all, I think they look like they're having fun. <laughs> they look as if they're racing to see who can do this work the fastest, who can do it the best, who can do it with the most style and the most swag, we might say. <laughs> um, and who can attract the most attention from the young ladies. Okay, that's the point. Um, traditionally, all of the men in a village are going to be born here. And that's something that, that's really important. Uh, men are born into the lineage group. They inherit land in this particular society from their fathers as opposed to their mother's brother. They inherit from their father. They work for their fathers and the senior men until they are in their late 20s. So they have to work, sort of traditionally, they stay in the village, they work in the village, until that group of men allows the next group of young men to marry and gives them land, okay? So they're also showing off to their dads to prove that they are capable and ready even though they're not, but <laughs> to um, inherit land and marry. And this is a system which Africanists call age grades. So among a group of children born around the same time, maybe within three or four years of each other, five at the most, those kids are going to grow up together. They're going to go through every stage of life together initiation, marriage, girls are going to have their first children around the same time, they're going to become elders around the same time, their children will get married. So at every stage in life, they're together and they're moving through these age grades. Okay. Um, and men are born into an age grade in their particular society. Women leave to get married and then become part of an age grade in their husband's village. And these particular boys, we see them being socialized into manhood by working together and by working the land for their fathers. Once they can prove that they can handle their shovels, so to speak, and feed their families, the senior men then turn over the responsibility of land to them. They give them bride wealth to marry and to start their own households. And for example, here is a younger boy who's probably imitating his older brothers. Um, this particular shot gives us a good picture of these buns, as well as of this embankment, the dike, which separates two fields. And this thing can be pretty tall, depending on the field. So if you are in a mangrove field where there's a high tide, I've seen photographs from Guinea-Bissau. You can see this one is <coughs> relatively low compared to the size of a boy of maybe eight or nine years old. I've seen embankments that are twice as tall as a grown man. 
And these would have been right on the edge of, close to the edge of the sea, okay? Close to the edge of the sea, sort of the farthest reaches of the red mangrove trees. And it's amazing to sort of see a man standing there with his shovel and see this dike towering behind him. And you think about the labor that goes into building that. So let's talk a little bit about the shovel. Um, this shovel in what is today coastal Guinea, along the river, which is the Nunez River, is called Mankumbal. We call it, historians, anthropologists, people who are studying material culture, call it a wooden fulcrum shovel. So it's made out of wood. It's, there's a concavity in it. The length of the shovel, foot, the length, the width, the thickness, depends on the fields in which the, the, the farmers are working. Okay, so all of this, the length, the width, the concavity, is variable. It's tailored according to the, the terrain. The thickness of the weeds, the depth of the water, the heaviness of the soil. So these shovels would be custom designed for a particular farmer and for a particular field. Um, the height of the shovel is, the, the, the stick on which the shovel is mounted is about the height of a man. So each shovel should stand about as tall as a particular man. Now, young men tend to use larger, heavier shovels. People who also have fields that are waterlogged with heavier, more clay-like soils also tend to use larger, heavier shovels. And Mankumbal is the name, sort of the generic name for a shovel of standard length. But in each village, each of these variations of the shovel has its own name, okay, in each language. Elder men tend to use the original mankumbal, which I'll show you in a minute. And this particular tool, the original size, dates back to about 1000 CE. So we're looking about 1000 AD when my linguistic evidence shows this shovel began to be used. Variations of the shovel are used as far north as the Gambia River. Now, I'm going to go to this slide so you can see. When the, this is the standard size of Mankumbal. And you can see there's not much concavity in this. It looks like it's pretty straight, but it's slightly curved. And this particular version has a metal foot. Mankumbal did not always have a metal foot, OK? Um, in this particular area of coastal Guinea, there are no indigenous iron deposits. So people who lived on the coast did not smelt their own iron. They traded for iron. And that's not unusual among coastal peoples between the Gambia River and this area of Guinea. Um, in this particular region, people traded with groups who spoke Mande languages. So coming from the interior, um, very well-developed iron smelting culture and technology. And my research shows that this iron foot is added around 1500. And it's added to clear the red mangroves. So we're not quite sure, but probably, certainly by 1000. People are cultivating rice in the white mangroves that are directly bordering their villages. With the expansion of um, rice cultivation for a subsistence market and possibly to sell to Portuguese, British, Portuguese and British traders, um, 
rice cultivation expands into the region of red mangroves that border the sea, okay? Much tougher, much ropier uh, roots that clearing these roots is facilitated with the foot, the iron foot of Mankumbal. Now, I've talked a little bit about the gender and the age distribution of labor in the villages. I want to talk a little bit about what elder <coughs> men do in the fields. This was the first, if you remember back to the first picture of the man and his son, okay, this is the father. And a father who has, he's a father who has sons <coughs> who are not quite, they're not yet men. He's still very much in charge, okay? He's still sort of training um, his son to the point where he'll be able to turn over the land to his son. He's a bit of an older father in that sense. He had several girls, and then he had these two sons, one of which was probably in his late teens the other of which was a tiny boy when I was there. He was probably two. So I'll, I'll show a picture in a minute um, of, an, of a father who's a little bit more typical. But these, these elder men, one important thing about him, though, is that his, fa his father has already <coughs> passed away. Okay, so the land is his. His father has passed. He is le chef de famille of the entire family. He's the oldest. He's the firstborn boy and he's in charge of all of the land for himself and his brothers, all of their wives, all of their children, all of their sons, he's it. It's a lot of responsibility, okay? And he, because his son is still a teenager, he's sort of supervising um, his socialization and the socialization of his age grade while he has all of this responsibility. It's more typical to have what I call the sandwich generation of a man whose father, a, mid, a man in his 40s, I don't know if that makes us middle-aged, but a man in his 40s whose father is still living, whose sons are, I call it, at the age of mouthiness. <laughs> So he's in the middle. His father is still around to tell him how, what to do, and that he's not doing things the way they used to be done. And his son is old enough to tell him, you know, again, that he's not doing it right, and that his son could do it better. So on both ends, he's got someone telling him that they can do it better, right? So typically, a man of this age would be working with the smaller boys. He's using this shovel. They're using that shovel. The boy of eight to nine that I showed you, he would be working with the smaller boys if his son was older. And a man in the sandwich generation would have to ride herd over those mouthy boys, right? Those mouthy boys who are out there shredding their stuff in the rice fields, showing off to girls. They are not ready for any responsibility whatsoever. <laughs> but they think they can do it better. That would be his role. Some things are universal, right? <laughs> so during my field work, and this is not his generation, this would be his father's generation. So these are the older men who sit around and tell stories about how things used to be and how they should be and how everybody has it wrong today. So during my field work, these old men also played jokes on an unsuspecting researcher. <laughs> <laughs> While everyone else is doing all of the work, they had time to, to play jokes on me. And I'm going to try to recount this without blushing. So these men would probably be in their 70s and 80s. 
and they, uh, in interviewing them about Makumbal and where the shovel came from and how it evolved and how it was different in different villages and how it seemed to be different, constructed differently for men at different stages in their lives. Every old man in every village told me that even though now he worked with this shovel, okay, of this length and this, of this length, we'll just leave it at that. When he was younger, he had the longest shovel in the village. <laughs> and that today's young men would have been no match for him, whichever elder he was. And <laughs> the more elderly the man, the, young, the longer the shovel was in the past. Okay, so if they were 90, these shovels were like, you know, really long. And it took me a while, <laughs> much longer than it probably should have, to figure out that they weren't really talking about shovels. <laughs> And I even asked one of the elders to help me to draw a picture. I just don't understand <laughs> the mechanics of this. And that's one of the, when one of the middle-aged sandwiched men stepped in and said, listen, <laughs> these guys are no good. <laughs> I share this story to emphasize the sense of pride, you know, the sense of bravado, the sense almost of machissimo, that these male rice farmers, all of whom were sort of the, the grandfathers were the chef de famille, you know? They're holding all the land. They're still in control, dictating what their sons do. Their sons are doing all of the work for their fathers, they're still working for their fathers. They're still working for their brothers. They're still working for their wives. And these are polygamous families for the most part. Um, they're training these mouthy boys. <laughs> they were a trip. They're training these mouthy boys so that they can one day sit around and tell jokes and sit around and tell stories. And if these mouthy boys don't take some responsibility, they're really going to be in trouble, right? Um, there's really, there's a very, I think, important pride that comes from what they create with the work of their hands and the sweat of their brows. And the men were not alone. We've only talked about the men to date. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the women. Because once the men have prepared, this is a rice nursery. So this is the first field work is to prepare the rice nursery. Once they have done that, then the women sow the rice seeds. Now here, I want you to take notice of how dry it is. Okay, It's relatively dry, depending on the variety of rice it would be sown in an area that's relatively dry. Every rice variety is different. Some can handle brackish water better. Some can handle deeper water better. Asian varieties, and most people today in Africa grow Asian rice varieties. They tend to yield more, okay? And I probably should have said at the very beginning that there are two rice varieties in the world. One is domesticated in Asia and one in West Africa. Um, West Africans have been growing Asian rice varieties since around the 1500s, okay? But they adapted them to the ways they had already grown West African rice. Um, they prefer them in many ways because it yields more and it's easier to process. Uh, but it doesn't grow in the most marginal areas. It doesn't grow when there's not enough rain. It doesn't grow when there's too much salt. It doesn't grow when there's too much rain. <laughs> so everything has to be on an even keel for these varieties to grow. But when it is, they yield more. 
And so typically people try to diversify, especially nowadays when the rainfall is all over the place because of climate change. But if you look at this region of West Africa, rainfall has always been highly variable. Okay? So people have learned because of that to grow rice in all of these different microenvironments with all of these different techniques, with all of these different forms of irrigation so that no matter what happens with rainfall, hopefully you're going to have a crop. Hopefully you can ensure food security through diversity. Okay? Um, so in grow, planting rice in a nursery is one way for those varieties that don't like salt, don't like too much water, need things on an even keel, this is sort of a, an incubator for them so that they can grow to a certain stage. They can germinate in these ideal and controlled conditions before you put them in the rice field. Okay? So these women are broadcasting primarily, sowing the seeds by broadcasting it over these buns which the men have created. And this is prime, this is a, this could be done by women from teenagers up. Yes? Did you say they're putting it on top of the bun? At the moment, they're putting it on top. At the moment. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. And so here you see that the rice is germinated. This is probably about 60 days of growth. And it has to be pulled up very carefully. Pulling it up, sort of shaking it so that the dirt comes off the bottom, combing it so it's relatively neat on top, tying it and putting it aside to be transplanted, replanted. Now the work becomes more specialized. You would not want your teenage daughter who is actually more interested in the boys passing by to be left alone to do this work. They would have to be closely supervised because if the rice is pulled up improperly, if, it's, if the roots are damaged, that's your crop. So this is, this is pretty specialized work. Uh, I noticed how dry it is. Okay, she's really in dry land. Notice her posture. How many of us could maintain this posture for about six hours a day? We just have to take a minute in. <laughs> Meditate on that for a minute. It's it's not easy. It's not easy. Straining the youngest of backs. This is a woman with uh, not babies, but young children. Okay? So this is the kind of work that women in their 30s, 40s, by the time you're getting to your 50s, you want someone else to do it. You want to supervise <laughs> those young girls who are watching the boys. It's their turn. Right? So hopefully they have become more mature and responsible, and they're able to bend their backs over this rice for hours. OK. Now the rice is being transplanted. OK? The rice is being replanted. Um, and if you'll notice, look at the water. She's standing in water almost up to her knees. And at this point in, all of this is done during the rainy season. So you sort of begin when the rains start. But when the rains start, it rains for a couple hours, every couple of days. By the time, hopefully by the time you have your rice planted, it's going to rain torrentially for days on end. And it's not going to stop. Okay? But this, during this sporadic rain, you could be standing in water, working under the rains. 
with your back bent at a very unnatural angle for several hours on, on, on end, okay? Um, okay, and I think we have, yep, yeah, one more shot. Again, she's in, she's in water. And if I think back to that photograph of my great-grandmother, this rice, this bundle of rice is gonna be put in the ground like this. So they're digging holes with their fingers and they're putting in the rice, okay? They're sort of putting it in there, yes? Why, why couldn't they just be one? Why do they have to pull it up and transplant Because it depends on the location of your rice field. Rice doesn't grow in salt water. Not a lot of things do. Um, but the mangroves, where the water and the soils are brackish, are the soils that can yield the most. So in order to plant certain varieties, so in order to plant high yielding Asian rice varieties in a high yielding, high risk field, you get a better result if you plant it in a nursery first and allow it to germinate. So that when the rice seedlings are at a critical stage in development, they're not in salt water. They're in a dry field. So this is a salty water, saltier. Yes, yes, exactly, yes. Are they putting them in as individual um, plants or as a large bundle, small bundle? As a, as a medium-sized bundle. So probably as much as you could hold in your fingers here. But they tie them in a pretty large bundle so you take a section and then you put it in. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. What is the temperature? And in South Carolina, when they did this, what month would they do the seeding? Yeah, that's a good question. The temperature is, it's cooler than normal, but it's still hot. So this would be considered the winter. I would say it's probably. 75 degrees, and it depends on whether it's raining or not. When it rains, it tends to be a few degrees cooler. In South Carolina, it also would have been done in, in the early, let me get this right. Um, in South Carolina, it would have been done in the summertime, so around the same time. Um, but in South Carolina, let's go back for one second. Okay, so if you see this, <coughs> same technology, the dikes, the buns, um, this, these things break. The dikes break, especially if you're closer to the tide or if you have flooding, all kinds of stuff can happen. They have, so they have to be repaired. And typically, the repair of these things happens in the winter, January, February. And so people, enslaved people, enslaved men, they call them trunk minders, were literally out there in the winter months standing in cold water um, trying to get under the earth to repair these, these dikes. So that plays a role in the health of people who are doing the work. Yeah. Yes. How soon does happening have to get transplanted? How what? How fast? I mean, can you say like a day, two days? Yeah. A, day? a couple of days. It can sit out for a couple of days. If they're out for more than maybe three days, they would be put in water. Yeah, they would have to be put in water. OK. Thank you for the questions. So if you were an older woman, uh, you would want this to be your job. So she's actually walking on the buns. And you see the buns are submerged, right? She's walking on them. And she's softening the earth. She's softening the earth. 
And I may have made a mistake. I think I said that the rice was planted between the buns. It's actually planted on top because she's, yeah, she's walking and she's poking holes in it so that people can come behind her and put the seedlings in. So I apologize for making that mistake. Is that what I said? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. And last picture of younger women, women with young children, children on their backs. Here you can see them taking a larger section and breaking it and putting it stemming. Yeah. That looks impossible. It's, it helps if you've done it most of your life. <laughs> and you can see here those seedlings tied and put in water mm -hmm. so that they don't dry out before they're transplanted. Yes. Do they get dispensation when they're pregnant? Because obviously you couldn't do that when they're pregnant. Yes. No. No, no, no. Ooh. <laughs> How pregnant do you have to be? <laughs> I do not remember. I'm trying to think. I don't remember seeing any pregnant women while I was in the field. Um, my understanding, though, is that pregnant women would not do this work, OK? Um, not this work in terms of bending and exerting for that period. And women who had recently given birth, so women who had tiny babies, maybe under three or four months old, would not do it either, yeah. OK. Um, OK, so I hope that you can see a little bit of how age grades among women work and how there's a gender division of labor. There's also an age division of labor. And it breaks down sometimes. Not everyone has young daughters. Not everyone has, um, well, you have the teenagers who are in La La Land. <laughs> <laughs> then you have the young women who are in their 20s and they're a little bit more responsible. Not everyone has those family members, OK? One could, for the work that's done by men or the work that's done by women, you could hire an association. So the age grades that I've spoken about, all of the young mouthy boys have a group. They get together. They can be hired. So let's say I have a mangrove rice field that used to belong to my grandfather. And we haven't cleared it for years because there hasn't been enough rain. But the last couple years, the rain has been abundant. And I can see in that field that I had to abandon when I was a child, that my dad abandoned, that there are weeds growing that show me that this swamp is sweet and that rice is going to grow here. I can hire the age group of young mouthy boys to go out there and clear that field. <laughs> they have all that mouth, right? <laughs> Let's put it to, and all that energy, you know, put them to work. And they will come out for two or three days and they will, all of them, will work on my field. And then when it's time to have the field sown, whether it's the, the nursery or the field, I can hire the girls. Go out there and sow the field. So you know, if the boys are working, the girls are going to come and watch. When the girls are working, the boys are going to come and watch. And afterwards, whenever you have either family labor or association labor, you feed everybody. Okay. So this is a feast that takes place um, within the rice field. Uh, it's an opportunity for another opportunity for the young girls to show their readiness for marriage, <laughs> their cooking skills, their serving skills. This um, field could be a couple miles from the village. So the food is cooked in the village and walked out to in large pots on someone's head, uh, walked out to the rice field so that the people who have worked very hard can be fed and fed abundantly. They are eating rice with um, a palm oil stew that is prepared with, do you know palm oil? Mm -hmm. Sort of a red, thick, OK. They sell it now in Whole Foods. 
I actually cook with it, I bake with it. Um, it has a bit of a strong taste, but and it's pretty high in fat, but it's also supposed to have some good stuff. Um, fish, small fish, and within these rice fields, you can, you'll catch all kinds of stuff. You know, fish and, uh, I'm thinking in French, cane cutters, little four-legged, I don't know how to translate it. No, no, no. No, you can catch little fish, but these are sort of four-legged agouti. It's like a it's like a cane rat or something <laughs> that eats the rice. Um, so these would be small fish, onions, and pepper. Very hot and spicy sauce. Yes. I said aguti. Yeah, it's that in English too. Is it? Yeah. Okay. What is it? Aguti. It's a mammal. It's a small. She's like this kind of a rat. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I'm a, I'm a vegan, so I wouldn't know. <laughs> but I hear it's pretty tasty. <laughs> I have a quick question about this. Yes. So, but the women are going to get married to people who are further away, right? Yes. Other villages. Yes. But they got to show off their. I'm going to make a great homemaker anyway. Like Absolutely. Else. Absolutely. Okay. And <laughs> word does get around, and you want to create a buzz <laughs> about your marriage ability. And sometimes there's practice before you find that right one. So this could be a practice round or two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> OK. So during, yes. Yes, oh yes. The yellowness comes from the palm oil, which when you cook it, turns sort of light orange. Um, there's, there's a lot of seasoning in there, uh, a lot of pepper and fish. Um, but I think it's really the palm oil that, it, when it separates, it gets sort of yellow orangish. Okay. Now, once the rice is planted, um, you move into what's called the period of suffering or the, the hunger period, where the rice is growing in the fields. Um, typically, it's raining quite a lot. And for many families, the rice from last year's harvest is exhausted. But you're waiting for rice from this year's harvest to, to be ready. <clears throat> It can be a very difficult time, and this can be a moment when people experience seasonal hunger, where they either have to buy imported rice, <clears throat> which can be very expensive, especially during this period, or they have to eat things like cassava or like fonio that rice farmers don't really like to eat, right? They say it's hard on the stomach. They say it you know, tastes like paper. Um, it doesn't fill you up. It's also a time where you have to guard your rice fields. So this is a temporary kitchen that's built in the field um, that's sort of, it's temporary, but it's permanent. So every year you're going to make your kitchen here. During this period, the father of the family gets up before dawn to go to the rice fields to scare away birds, mammals who are attempting to eat the rice. Um, he will stay in the rice fields all day long. and. After dawn, the mother and the children, the wives and the children, are going to come and occupy this small temporary kitchen, prepare all the meals there, and spend the day in the fields. The two critical times are really dusk and dawn for uh, these rice predators, as you can call them. And here, slingshots are the primary weapon against these. So this is sort of the foray of the young boys. This is where they get to show off their hunting skills. They can trap, they little, you know, slingshots, lance spears, all kinds of things. Noise makers for the youngest children, building makeshift scarecrows, things like that. This young mother's son was too young yet to be good with his slingshot. So she's out there herself 
protecting her fields um, from, from these predators attempting to eat the rice. It can be a very difficult time. Uh, this is the time where many families experience um, hunger, as I said, because there's just not enough food, because the hours are very long, um, and because this trekking back and forth, carrying cooking pots, children, et cetera, is physically demanding. Um, it's physically demanding, particularly when you have not had enough to eat. The rice harvest, primarily done by children. There's not much at this point they can do <laughs> to hurt the rice. <laughs> So this is a good job for, for younger children to gather it and to cut it with a sickle. Here's a better shot. And then to tie it into bunches. And here's some examples of the rice tied, harvested, cut, tied, and Trans being transported back to the village. Now, a couple things I'd like you to notice in this photograph. This is water, okay? So they're crossing a stream over a bridge made of a coconut tree. How many of us have walked on a coconut tree? It's not the sturdiest tree around. <laughs> It's pretty thin, <laughs> and it's held up here by, by stakes and poles, okay? These are teenage girls carrying very heavy loads on their heads, and this is one of those opportunities for them to show their grace and style for that practice run. <laughs> um, so if you can imagine, just try to picture balancing this thing on your head on a very narrow balance beam, shall we say, while, I'm trying to think of the academic word here and it's not coming, so I'll just say the first one that comes to my head, switching <laughs> as one walks over this bridge. Does everyone know how to switch? <laughs> Moving your hips as fast as you can. <laughs> These things can only come together for a teenager, right? The rest of us cannot put that skill set together. <laughs> so another opportunity for the teenage girls, this is their, you will not see their mothers doing this, if at all possible. <laughs> Let those energetic girls go out there and bring the rice back to the village. Another example. Wow. Yeah. Really, I think there's Olympic gold to be made here. <laughs> <laughs> I think also runway magic. I mean, to yeah. be able to stand straight enough to, that the whole thing doesn't topple over and that you don't topple over with it. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Okay, so once the rice is brought back and allowed to dry, if you notice, these are pretty green. They've just been harvested. They've got to dry out. All of the rice is sort of laid out in an open area that has been swept clean. Just dumped there, and beaten, beaten with rods to separate, to separate the hull, the sort of top of the rice from all of this straw and stalk. Okay. And that can, that's primarily done by, by men, younger men. This is a girl who is, once it's been separated, she's now processing it just enough for tonight. So if you remember, many people aren't going to have rice at this point. They're eating something else or they're eating one meal a day 
or they're buying if they have the means imported rice. She's harvest she's processing just enough for one night. How long does it take to dry? It takes a couple of weeks. And it really depends on whether or not it continues to rain. Because if it, you know, gets wet or if it's not, let's say if it's not moved in time, not stored in a place where it's covered and it gets wet again, then it takes longer. Is but Germany, is there a worry of losing rice? Yes. If it gets wet and it stays wet, you can lose it. Yeah, you can. Okay. So after it's beaten, the husk that comes off, that is taken off, is put into a mortar and pestle, and it's beaten again. This time, the pestle is moved in a rhythmic fashion um, to really sort of crush it. I think, does anyone else use a mortar and pestle here to crush herbs or spices? OK. Think of that in a large. <laughs> <laughs> a much uh, larger scale, okay? This pestle is going to be the height of a woman. That's how it's measured. It's very heavy. It's very heavy. And I have to say, when I was in, in the field, I was in pretty good shape, much better shape than I'm in right now. Um, I think I did about 200 push-ups a day. That was my exercise, and I would walk a mile or two miles. And I stood one day. I was convinced that this was the easiest thing. I stood in a line of teenage girls who were singing. Often the work is done in groups, OK? A group of girls who were singing and chanting and beating rice. I could barely lift the thing once, let alone up and down in a rhythmic motion while I sang. Oh, give me a break. <laughs> you know, to keep time, it's, it's serious work. It's a serious. And so mothers sort of train their daughters from as early as possible. Get a, like having at, you know, at Whole Foods, you have a little shopping cart so the little girl can get a little mortar and pestle and let her stand next to you <laughs> and pretend she's doing it. This girl is probably about 10. So she's old enough and strong enough now that she can do some of this labor with her mother. I know. Yeah, look at her arms. <laughs> <laughs> and you can, you know, she hasn't gone through puberty yet. She's sort of at right at the beginning stages. Um, and she will, as she grows, she'll get stronger and taller and be able to finally take it over so her poor mother can retire. <laughs> but this is very heavy labor. It's very heavy labor. And women might do this two or three times a day. People if they have rice, if it's been a good harvest, they're eating rice three meals a day. And there's no refrigeration, there's no food processor, there's no Safeway. Um, and so each meal, rice has to be processed for each meal. So what are they doing? You say they're removing the husks when they do this? Yes, they so are. are they then, uh, yes. yes. Shifting. Shifting them then is the shifting. So they're not eating the husk. No. So they end up with what we call white rice. Well, yes and no. It depends on how much of the husk you remove. And rice that was sold that was sold commercially would have to be polished to the point where you remove all of the husk. Rice that's used for subsistence is not polished to that to that extent. And this is one reason why women in particular preferred Asian rice varieties. That husk is easier to remove. It's easier to polish. And the rice, because of the color of the, because of the, color of the, of the variety, is easier to polish and make white. Whereas the African rice, Ariza glabarima, has a thicker husk. Um, often the, the rice itself is black, sort of grayish, 
Um, it is better for you, yes, but it's not as pretty. And uh, back in the, the 1500s, 1600s, the Portuguese wanted white rice. And so if, you, if your market demands white rice, then the preference would be for Oriza sativa. Um, we know now that those Oriza glabarima is better for your health. Most people would also say it tastes better. Yeah. So here, you're taking the rice that's been beaten and fanning it into the wind. Actually, this is a basket method of pouring it into the wind so that the chaff blows away. And this is actually the fanner that is more familiar to the South Carolina context of tossing it into the wind so that the rice falls down and the chaff blows in a different direction. Yes? So your great-grandmother brought her skills to the Carolinas? Guessing? My great grandmother was, she was not enslaved. She was not enslaved. Her, let's see, her parents, I'm trying to remember the family tree off the top of my head. I'm not sure if her parents were born free. If we're talking 1865. Um, they, they probably, her parents probably were enslaved. Um, but I'm not sure when our first ancestor came. So, but if you go back as many generations as one would need to go back, yes, in theory, these skills were brought from the Upper Guinea Coast. Yeah. I'm just not sure the exact link when that, when that occurred for my particular family. Yeah. And I'm just going to warn you that you're about your time. OK. Oh, yeah. <laughs> for my getting to the airport. OK. All right, all right, all right. OK, so I just want us to end by thinking about the pride of West African rice farmers and the work of their hands. Um, with the men in the rice field with their show. Okay, just, I just, I can't, I, I, I can't. look at that. <laughs> I love this picture. And you can see the difference between this shovel and mankumbal, which was a half or a third that size. So it really depends. And these, this man in particular, oh my gosh. He had the mouthiest of boys. He had the mouth. So he's got his dad on the one hand being very troublesome. It was his father. And his son on the other, you know, and he's in the middle. But he doesn't have a show. He's got two, no. <laughs> well, that's true. These are his younger brothers. So I guess he's just kind of, he's the overseer of all, yeah. <laughs> um, so the, the pride that both men and women take in providing for their families, providing for their children, providing for their parents, um, and the sense of ability and responsibility that is so deeply embedded in how these West African farmers define manhood and womanhood. And what we know is that on the American side of the Atlantic, rice cultivation becomes completely denatured. It's taken, the, the work of their hands of enslaved rice farmers is expropriated, it's exploited, and even if they could take pride in their craftsmanship, many people lost their health, their youth, their lives in the rice fields and they were never allowed to benefit from the fruits of their labor. Part of what I'm doing now is looking at how subsistence farming and subsistence farming systems are very different from commercial farming systems. And so we look at slavery and enslavement as a social and an economic system. I think within that, looking at the way that rice farming develops in West Africa as a subsistence crop versus the way it develops in South Carolina as a commercial crop. 
And in doing so, you see this West African system is being sustainable. It's based on family labor. It's based on village labor. It's based on relationships. It's based on um, generations working with one another and for one another and contributing to this a uh, collective sense of responsibility. And in a commercial system, this labor, enslaved Africans' labor, was completely expendable. Completely expendable. To the point where the overall death and infant mortality rates were ghastly. And this is something that remains unspeakably high in coastal South Carolina up until the Civil War, up through the Civil War, and I have to say up beyond the Emancipation Proclamation, because there were, long story, which I, I can answer in questions, but on many of the rice plantations after the Emancipation Proclamation goes into effect, people were still enslaved. Okay? They were still enslaved. And they remained enslaved as long as the slaveholders could get away with it until the Union armies come plantation by plantation and liberate the Africans. Okay? And so that's something for me to even think about that, oh my God, my ancestors were enslaved beyond the Emancipation Proclamation. That's, that's really something that can play with one's mind. Um, so the same field, the same floods that fertilized inland and tidal rice fields also created incredibly deadly environments for enslaved Africans. Historian William Dusenbear has said it best. He estimates that two thirds of enslaved children born on rice plantations died in the 19th century before they were 15 years old. That's two thirds. From malaria? From all kinds of things. Malaria, gastrointestinal infections, low birth weight. Um, I'm gonna enumerate it in one minute. Uh, and that almost 40%, and this is a conservative estimate, 40% died in their first year alone. By comparison, by the 1720s, 38% of children on non-rice plantations in the US died before they turned 15. Now that's too many. 38% is too many. 66% is just, yeah, it's unspeakable. And in pockets of the low country, such as along the Savannah rivers, the rates were much higher. The rates were much higher. For example, the enslaved population on Gowrie Plantation, which is located on the Savannah River, suffered a 90% death rate between 1830, 1833 and 1864. And this goes back to your question, in large part because Gowrie's slave quarters were located on the banks of the swamp. Slaveholders required this to maximize their control over enslaved people's labor, movements, and lives. So they wanted them living as close to the rice fields as possible. Now, there was a time in the early 1700s when rice is just becoming the staple crop that whites, planters, also lived near these rivers. And they quickly learned that this was not a good idea, right? And so that's why during the, the summer, they would go to Charleston or to Savannah or to the Pinelands or to the Sea Islands to get away from this really unhealthy environment. That's in the early 1700s. By 1864, on the Savannah River, enslaved people are still living in these conditions. The Savannah River in particular had really bad water. And so there were all kinds of waterborne diseases that the children in particular were, were subject to. 
And I think, Michelle, you asked me about research moments. I have to tell you that as an Africanist, this kind of stuff makes me crazy. It literally just makes me want to swing from that pipe up there <laughs> and climb. <laughs> because if I think about, I think about two things in West Africa. I think about the colonial period where colonizers are, anthropologists are doing this research and finding out that women who are nursing, that the children are malnutritioned during the hungry season. Because when these mothers go out to spend the day in the rice fields, they're leaving their children with a granny in the village. And they can't nurse them as often because they have to go back and forth, right? And it's so deadly out there with malaria and with the mosquitoes and the rain and this. That's why they're leaving the young children there, OK? That's number one. Number two, I have been thinking about the transatlantic slave trade. And the fact that, it's a long story, but the fact that many of these coastal groups are um, changing the way they build their houses and build their villages to protect themselves during the trade. And one of the things, and so they, people feel relatively safe. They are relatively safe in their homes and in their villages from raids. They're not safe in their rice fields. They're not safe going to their rice fields because they have to walk this way to get there through you know, mangroves and forests and swamps and whatever that you cannot protect. So while I can't find evidence of, because Portuguese and British and French travelers and explorers and slave traders didn't care about this. So I can't find evidence of where these villages are located. I can find evidence that people had to walk great distances to get to their fields. So some kind of way, they must have known that you don't put a rice field next to a village. And if 90% of your children are dying, something's wrong. Something's wrong. This is 1864. OK, so so OK. How are people dying? Chronic malaria, respiratory ailments, cholera. Um, children from tetanus and puniness, gastrointestinal and bowel diseases, particularly along the Savannah River because of that black water, chronic bouts of deadly diarrhea. I talked about working in the winter and early spring under the rains, um, repairing the dikes and the irrigation systems, standing in cold, wet water and swamps brought respiratory ailments. I did not mention, but I'm sure you can imagine, women being burdened by pounding rice and finding that when children were made to pound rice too early and you're not pounding enough rice for your family, you're pounding for a commercial market. Those children did not survive to adulthood. Okay. Women who are put in the fields Five days after leaving their child bed. Five days after giving birth. They're We're talking about in the South, Carolina. South Carolina. Yes. Back in the rice fields, contracting all kinds of infections, um, which are just, when you have to read about it, you just, uh, it's really hard to, to read about. So all of these factors contributed to immune deficiencies, low infant birth rates, and the overall mortality of the enslaved. Unfortunately, there's also no means of counting the number of miscarriages and stillborn children. So the, the rates would be even more ghastly if we could account for all of that. 
Um, and the rates for the 18th century are probably even more shocking than the rates for the 19th century. This is what happened to West African rice farmers and their descendants in the Low Country. And most historians agree that West African rice farmers captured, transported through the Middle Passage against their will, and enslaved on rice plantations contributed really important technology. Okay? So we saw the dikes and the buns in South Carolina as here underneath our hollowed out tree trunks, okay, with plugs on each side to let the water flow in and out. This becomes mechanized in South Carolina, but the earliest prototypes are straight from West Africa. The mortar and pestle that we saw for processing the rice, oh well. I think you remember the young girl and her mother, okay? As well as parboiling methods for cooking rice. They also agree that in, while enslaved Africans grew rice in their own food fields for their own subsistence without planters, planters never grew rice without slaves, ever. And at the end of the Civil War, when freed people were no longer willing to do that mud work, the, in the industry dies. Um, so as we honor West African rice farmers for their technology, for their knowledge and their expertise, I think we also have to honor the immense sacrifices, the immense suffering, the immense involuntary services of the enslaved. Thank you. I, I think we're going to just be able to take a couple of questions, questions. because she's the can't miss her airplane. So yes, do women live? I mean, you discussed this whole group of African men yes. who were the elders of the group. Did women live into their seventies and eighties? Was there a woman's group who would have had you on about it? <laughs> women. Women did live longer. Um, in the, I'm trying to think, in the villages where I work, though, there were not that many. And even older women didn't necessarily have time to sit around and joke and tell stories the way that men do. But there were women who lived into their 70s and 80s? There were. I, I, it, there are. In the particular villages that I worked, there were not as many. Yeah, there were not as many. And I don't know what the cause of that would be, and I'm not, I don't necessarily think that's representative. Yes, and then. Um, I have two questions. One is, um, I know that I've been on, seen in other plantations that blacks lived in slave quarters up into the 1970s, uh -huh. post reconstruction stuff, and I wondered if that, because it seems like rice wouldn't necessarily lend itself to sharecropping as well as some other types of things. And I wondered if sharecropping happened on the South Carolina coast afterward with, like basically with former slaves living the same lives. And the second thing I wondered is, have you tracked, like to me that mortality rate says that rice was so expensive that they could afford to buy new slaves. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if you tracked rice prices against slave prices. Hmm. I haven't done that yet. That's a very interesting point. Um, rice was, at one point, the most lucrative crop in the US South, even more so than sugar. Um, and so that tells me that it, it probably was less expensive to replace the labor force than it was to. Well, they had a choice, right? So they, they could have moved them, so they must have. I, I mean, that's, what, I don't know, that's my read of it, because it just was the best. Yeah. And sharecropping, the crop does not lend itself to sharecropping, but the land certainly does. And so people, there's, on the one hand, this area of South Carolina um, and Georgia, there's more, freed blacks have more access to owning land than they do in other parts of the U.S. South. Um, but people did share crop. People who could not afford to buy land or control land did share crop. 
and they grew other kinds of, of crops. Um, why can't I think of one off the top of my head? Uh, but people did grow, you know, all, all kinds of other crops. People even grew rice for themselves, but they grew rice in a subsistence way that didn't require this whole irrigation system. Up until the 1950s, um, there's evidence of people growing, African Americans growing rice, uh, but they were not gonna go back and work in those rice fields. They were not, and there was a big hurricane, a couple big hurricanes, the last one was in the 1890s, which means that many of these miles and miles and miles of these dikes and buns were destroyed. So they would have had to have been rebuilt. Mm -mm. There, that wasn't going to happen. One yes. more question for you guys in the market. Um, in the 1700s, when rice cultivation started in the United States, were there any other areas besides West Africa where rice was? I mean, they, they weren't growing rice in Europe. Or no. So they, you were able to find direct correlation between the West Africa and the southern U.S. The rice was grown in China and other parts of Asia, but it wasn't grown in salt water. So West Africa, the Upper Guinea Coast, and South Carolina are the only two places in the world where rice was grown in sort of a tidal area. Um, and in South Carolina, it's sort of right at the edge of the tidal reach. So in that area where there is some salt, but it's right on the edge of the fresh water. Um, so that particular technology, the only other place where it is grown is in West Africa. The hard part is, is that there really is no one-to-one -one direct evidence. What you have is evidence that a population of people from the region of West Africa where this technology is practiced is enslaved and transported against their will to a region where the technology develops. But to actually find those early precursors, aside from the hollowed out trunk and the mortar and pestle, have not been able to find, say, a field where you have that direct evidence. So that's the hard part for historians. But it didn't come from anyplace else. That seems very important. Yes, I think so. <laughs> my, my question goes along with that. Is that the, for rice to originally come to the Americas? Do you think it came from the West African slave trade and not from the trade with China on the Pacific coast? You mean the rice or the technology? Both. The rice period to be grown here. Mm. I think the, the questions are separate. I would say the technology did not come from Asia. The rice could have come from, the rice varieties themselves could have come from a number of different directions. But how to grow the rice, yeah. I think, is what we, what, what we can say came from West Africa. To, to Mexico, to all of the Americas? Yes. OK. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I'm You're welcome. You.